I Hate Politics is a podcast about a human activity we love to hate. I am Sunil Dasgupta. After 10 years of advocacy by education activists, Montgomery County Public Schools has finally launched a school profiles dashboard that displays basic data for each of its over 200 schools. The question is not about the data itself. Federal, state, and county laws require MCPS to publish plenty of data. The long-standing demand has been to make the data available in a way that parents, activists, policymakers, and the public generally can sort the data along various categories such as enrollment, demographics, learning, facilities, and others, and perhaps even generate reports along these parameters. Montgomery County, the state of Maryland, among many other jurisdictions, have launched open data platforms now almost 10 years ago as well. But MCPS has stayed away from the county's open data platform following an initial foray in 2016. So when MCPS launched the school's dashboard last week, I asked local education activists Laura Stewart, Audra Dove, Kathy Stoker, and Jill Ortman Faust, who herself had served on the Board of Education from 2014 to 2018, whether they got what they wanted. Let me start by telling you that I am not a holy man. Never thought I'd believe, I don't know if I even can. I heard a prophet saints, the Lord our God and angels. I prefer to spread the word of my muddled, troubled point of view. I, toss and turn my I Hit Politics is a podcast about our neighborhoods, workplaces, schools and streets, and our local governments as they function in diverse and democratic societies. This means our politics are dirty, messy, sometimes corrupt, with often self-serving politicians. But no matter how much we may hate politics, we are never exempt from it, even when we refuse to participate. In fact, the purpose of politics is to keep society functioning precisely when we don't agree with each other, like now. Music for this episode comes from Rockville pop and rock singer-songwriter Andrew Glore and his band Drew Pictures. You can find more of his music on Spotify and at DrewPicturesMusic.com. I toss and turn my soul to turn my mind is learned that books are burned sometimes. I've tried, I've been denied, I've told so many lies. Yes, I have prayed to heaven, made a saving day to get me laid. Oh, you got a trap, oh boy. You're listening to I Hit Politics. I'm Sunil Dasgupta. This is the 2023 giving season. Each week until the end of the year, we are giving space to local nonprofits to pitch for your support. These spots are not paid advertising, but available for free to organizations we have verified as legitimate and wonderful additions to our community. And we'll use your support well. We know that you give generously, and I hope you will consider giving to these nonprofit organizations this year. If you know of other nonprofits who would like to be featured, please reach out at producer at ihppod.org. 
Hi, my name is Jennifer Freeman, Executive Director of Community Farm Share. We are a Montgomery County based nonprofit that exists to build a connected, thriving local food system by reducing food and nutrition insecurity in communities lacking access to healthy, fresh produce options and supporting our local farmers. Our work's mission is a win win win. Every dollar to Community Farm Share accomplishes three things. One, it helps to support healthy families, particularly low income residents affected by diabetes and other chronic diseases. Two, builds up our local food system by supporting farmers for their dedication and hard work for growing the fresh produce. And three, addresses climate change and reduces carbon emissions by supporting regenerative farming practices that sink carbon and reducing our food supplies dependence on long distance transport. Food plays an important role in the season of harvest and holidays. By January, we may feel there's been too much. Unfortunately, for some of our neighbors, there will have been too little. This season, in partnership with local farm partners, Community Farm Share has launched a novel food drive concept with our Fresh Veggie Drive. Donors can shop for fresh veggies to donate, selecting the produce that the farmers have offered for that week, and produce is delivered to local food assistance providers. The Fresh Veggie Drive runs until December 18th. There are two ways you can help. You can donate money at www.communityfarmshare.org. You can also join the Veggie Drive at www.communityfarmshare.org forward slash fresh veggie drive. Thank you. Happy holidays. Do you worry about democracy but fear there's nothing you can do? Join the Civic Circle where we lift up youth voices and empower the next generation. I'm Eliza Newland Carney, the founder and president. We're a Montgomery County nonprofit that uses music and the arts to inspire young students to understand and participate in democracy. We're currently raising funds for an AmeriCorps team member to expand our program. To learn more and donate, please visit theciviccircle.org. I'd also love to invite you to join us at our Civic Spark holiday celebration in downtown Silver Spring on Sunday, December 17th. We'll have civic songs, delicious refreshments, creative activities, and a chance to hear from some of our region's most engaged civic and community leaders. Please look for details at theciviccircle.org. I hope to see you there. Thank you. Hi, this is Chris Rutledge, Vice President of External Affairs at Friendship Place. Every year, Friendship Place serves over 4,000 people, including hundreds of children and veterans, by providing them access to housing, food, clothing, and numerous other things people need to thrive. This year, you can take part in our really special Warmth and Joy campaign. Through the Warmth and Joy campaign, we will be able to purchase coats for people in need, toys for children around the holidays, and special holiday meals that will make this a much better season for so many people. Please go visit friendshipplace.org and see how you can be a part of this. We would really love your participation. Happy holidays from Friendship Place. Hello, my name is Janine Rauscher, and I am the founder and chair of the MoCo Pride Prom. During this season of giving, we ask that you consider a donation in support of the annual Pride Prom. This event celebrates the LGBTQ plus community in our county and provides a safe and welcoming space for LGBTQ plus youth to come together socialize, and dance the night away. However, organizing an event like this requires a significant amount of resources, and we need your help to make it happen. We are reaching out to our community to ask for your support in making this year's MoCo Pride Prom a success. Your donation will help us cover the costs of the venue, decorations, food, and other essential expenses that go into creating a magical evening for our LGBTQ plus youth. Your contribution will make a real difference in the lives of these young people, providing them with a safe and affirming space to express themselves and be themselves. Please consider making a donation today at givebutter.com slash 2024 pride prom. That's givebutter.com slash 2024 Pride Prom and help us make this year's MoCo Pride Prom a night to remember for all of our LGBTQ plus youth. Thank you. 
Hi, my name is John Bogaski. My wife Shelly and I lead Special Olympics here in Montgomery County. Each year, our all-volunteer program provides more than 500 practice or competition opportunities across 23 sports to more than 500 Special Olympics athletes from our area. While our programs are free for our athletes, we must raise funds locally for uniforms, equipment, facilities, and other costs. During this holiday season, I hope you can join Shelly and I in supporting our athletes. Please visit somdmontgomery.org, that's S-O-M-D, montgomery.org, and click on Support SOMO in the upper right corner to make a donation. Thank you for supporting our athletes. This is Ariani Ong with the Montgomery County Progressive Asian American Network. Support us as we seek to raise the visibility of Asian Americans in the county, increase representation and policy making, address hate crimes, advance equity in the schools, and champion immigrant rights. For more information, check us out at www.mocopaan.org and find us on Facebook and Instagram. Thank you. I'm Ilana Mintz, founder and executive director of Urban Adventure Squad, a Washington, D.C.-based nonprofit education organization that provides equitable, curriculum-aligned outdoor learning programs to children across the city. Did you know that classroom engagement and student attention are significantly higher after a period of learning outdoors? In a 2018 study published in Frontiers in Psychology, researchers found that the number of times teachers had to redirect distracted students was cut in half. The default position of the U.S. public education system is that indoors is for learning and outdoors is for recess. By middle school, recess largely disappears. Outdoor learning offers evidence-based benefits not just for student engagement, but for academic achievement, mental health, physical health, and attendance rates. Despite the evidence, over 98,000 D.C. public school students spend most of their time indoors. Urban Adventure Squad seeks to change that by building a culture of equitable, sustainable outdoor learning in our public education system and in our communities. By the end of the school year, we will have worked with over two dozen DC public and public charter schools and 1,800 students, and we rely heavily on your donations to support our work. Please consider a one-time or monthly donation of any amount by going to urbanadventuresquad.org and clicking the donate button. No dollar amount is too small. If 20 of you listening today become a $5 per month donor, we'll have raised $1,200. Thank you in advance for your support. We wish you peace and community this holiday season. I'm Sunil Dasgupta, host of I Hate Politics. Isn't the sheer breadth and variety of community organizations mind-boggling? They reach parts of our society that markets and the government find hard to reach. You can find links to the websites of the nonprofits in the show notes and on the I Hate Politics website, ihppod.org. You should also know that Urban Adventure Squad is founded and led by my wife, Ilana Mintz. I'll be back with local education activists, Kathy Stoker, Audra Dove, Laura Stewart, and Jill Ortman Faust. We can dance by the firelight Minnesota has got those kind of nights We built a house, not much at all Met the neighbors, let the grass grow tall Naturally, I bought a ring Laura Stewart, Jill Ortman Faust, Audra Dove, Kathy Stoker. Welcome to I Hate Politics. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Good to be here. Thank you. You are all education activists. Um, you are or have been parents in Montgomery County Public Schools. MCPS recently released a schools profiles dashboard that I believe you have been asking for for many, many years now. You get what you wanted? Visually, I think it's good. 
I, the design is really good. I think we have the right categories. I think the sort of mobility through the site is good. You're in the one-stop shop, so you can go, you know you're going to go to elementary school, you just click elementary schools and you pick their name and it's there. This has been at least a 10-year journey. So we are very grateful that they've put their toe in the water, that they've started this process, that there's been some conversion in thinking that it's okay for the public to have sortable information. That's huge. Um, and I'm very grateful that they have the Excel spreadsheet, which is basically the summary of schools in the glance that Laura and others, uh, people in the planning department, friends of ours have been having to create ourselves for 10 years. Um, that spreadsheet is everything in terms of what you see about the difference in demographics of our schools, because that was the first time I think that people saw, wait a minute, we have schools with less than 5% black students, or we have schools that are 90% Hispanic and less than 5% white students. What's going on in our county? And um, it's one thing to pitch that MC that Montgomery County is extremely progressive. Every office holder is Democrat and we love diversity. And then when you look at the difference in the huge wealth gaps between those schools and the demographics, it's like, yeah, we love diversity and we also like to stay separate. Say what the spreadsheet is. The spreadsheet is basically the demographics. So farms rate, which is free and reduced lunch, how many kids um, qualify for that. It includes all your demographics, racial breakdowns. Esau, special education. It also includes kindergarten class size and, you know, other levels of class size and also the attendance rate. What is better about this than the schools at a glance, which was sort of sheets of PDF organized by school, right? So what is what does the dashboard do that is more or different than what existed before? Laura, you want to take that? Personally, I like that we can, on the elementary school dashboards, we can now see the, all the, the map scores um, for each school. Say what MAP is. It's measures of academic progress. MAP scores are, are for K through eight. However, since the pandemic, um, they've included ninth graders in MAP M and MAP R um, as well. Okay. Although I don't know that that's been reported. So. And so when you get these MAP scores, these academic measure scores, do is there historical data behind it to show growth or not growth? I mean, anything like that? So you can go to the equity accountability models on the, that dashboard, which is not connected to the school profiles dashboard that I could that I could see. And that that's something that as an advocate and as a parent, I would like to see. I would like for it to be more fluid. Um, but right now you can see that on the elementary level, you can see map, but if somebody has the dashboard up, I don't know that you can do, you can't do a side-by-side -side comparison of this year, let's say, well, you wouldn't have this year, but last year and the year before. Okay. Um, so you don't, you can do com longitudinal comparison, but can you do um, um, comparison across schools? Is that possible in that other database? Um, no, no, you're not able to like click, oh, I can't, I want to see this school, this school, and this school, and then it will populate a page that will, that will show that. The measures of academic progress, right, which is a longitudinal measure over time, progress, right? It happens over time. But that data over time is not available. So the progress data itself is not available. Is that correct, Audra? So understand that MAP R and MAP M are in elementary schools are administered two to three times per year. When I look at this, let's say I just pull up um, an elementary school profile and I can see MAP R, um, I can see just generally a MAP R 30% of this particular school um, met MAP R was proficient in MAP-R for 22-23. Uh, That's a snapshot.
It's a snapshot. Okay. I don't know if that's then an average. I don't know if that's an average for the year. I don't know if that's fall, if it's winter, if it's spring. I don't know when that reporting, what that number represents. And I, and I can't see what the progress was from one year to the next. Based on the dashboard, you cannot tell if there is progress or not. That's right. And, and that's the issue, Sunil. I mean, when I was on the board, I literally, we would get a lot of data in PDF form and it would be sorted and out about alphabetical order, academic performance data. And I would literally go through with a highlighter marker to see the, to try and compare school against school. Very difficult to do. And I think if you do put that data out there where you can sort schools by demographics and by academic performance, you can see, wow, this school is outperforming what you might expect for this uh, for this for the school demographics based on you know what happens in our county. Um, what are they doing there that might be different? What are they investing in? You know, all of us here, right? We've been engaged in this work, you know, as volunteers and activists for many years. Um, Jill on the board, obviously. And, you know, when I first looked at these dashboards, I tried to take that hat off and really put the sort of parent caregiver hat on, right? And so, you know, and so I do want to applaud MCPS for thinking thoughtfully about how this site is laid out. How, what does it present that the sort of parent caregiver on the street who is, who has not been engaged as a volunteer and an activist is, is what we need for them on these what dashboards. What is your conclusion? I want to highlight the fact that these dashboards are available in many languages. So I think that's incredibly important, right? In our um, diverse and multicultural and multilingual county. I think that I applaud MCPS for not rolling this out until it was going to be available in many languages, right? They didn't put it in English first and say, hey, Spanish is coming, right? So um, I do want to let everybody listening to this podcast know that these that this information is available across many Learning languages. attendance assessments. Are those numbers available now? If you tab over, you know, to, to where we are looking at the um, map scores and at the high school level where we have kind of, a, you know, we have AP, SAT, IB scores. I think we're moving in the right direction in terms of showing communities what is happening in their schools in terms of learning, right? Are do our kids reaching proficiency? Um, and I think that's important because I think we all know, right? We all know that things look pretty grim, you know, in terms of scores post um, pandemic. And I, you know what, and it's hard, right? I'm sure that some of these numbers were hard for MCPS to, <laughs> to hit send on. But it's really important that we all know what the picture really looks like. And um, and so I'm glad APIB, to see that. APIB, right, is a learning measure. Um, so AP stands for Advanced Placement uh, Courses, and IB is the International Baccalaureate Courses. And how s students are doing in those courses is one measure of a uh, school performance. And are you able to tell that using the dashboard? No, you can't see um, you can't see using the dashboard what schools offer, which AP courses um, you would have to. And that's one of the things I had put in, in my notes that I will offer as feedback, that it would be nice to be able to have a link to that deeper da data that um, the Office of Shared Accountability puts out each year, which shows the previous year's results um, for the entire school, not just for graduating seniors. Um, what what the courses are so you could actually see and to be able to sort on that data so that you can see which schools offer which courses and how the students are performing because unfortunately the performance is different from school to school um, for those AP and IB exams the performance is different and and it can be broken down on, on based on demographic if we had had that data sortable as summarized for years, we would have less inequity between schools because it would have called attention to that inequity. Our data in our school system should not be predictable by zip code, and it is now. Also, the table, the little tables that are on the tabs, I've tried to like cut and paste them so I could put them somewhere else and I couldn't do it. 
The other thing that's missing uh, from the dashboard is the environmental health and the, some of the facility um, data that we do have. So for instance, we test um, lead in the water every three years and there's a report on that. So it'd be nice to um, at least have a link to that um, on the school profile. Also, maybe when the HVAC system was replaced, because um, this is coming up as a huge issue um, over the last year or so, and for longer, where HVAC systems are um, getting older, they are not able to find as many parts. Um, it's kids are cold or extremely warm in classrooms. Along with air quality. And air quality, you know, with COVID. There's more data for sure that can be added. Um, I know, again, they, they wanted to start somewhere and this is where they started. For the kind of average family, unless they're shopping for a school, right? Unless they're like moving into the area and they're like literally shopping for a, ha a home or apartment or a place they're gonna live or what school community they're gonna join. Okay, that that family might really be, you know, want the functionality of comparing this school to that school and this school to that school. I again, I think it's more I think it's important for the parents, caregivers, and students who really want to know about the building they're walking into every day. I think more detail about the special programs and classes that are offered, right? How many, which APs are offered and how are the kids doing? Um, which, you know, are we data that shows us whether the interventions we have employed and invested in at that school are working, right? Are our farm schools and our emerging multilingual learners, like, are they, do, are they doing better every year because of investments we all as taxpayers and advocates are making? So I, again, like, I think that information is really important as an advocate and analyst of this data. I, of course, want to be able to compare as much as possible across a whole matrix of schools and divisions and areas of our county. But I, but I, again, I'm, I'm really pleased to see that the design, at least what I interpret is the overall design of this dashboard is more um, focused at the parent caregiver student. Knowing how the neighboring school is doing and being able to come to your school and say, look, the neighboring school is doing better on this or that is a huge, uh, I would say, um, instrument in the hands of parents that they cannot have and do not have if they don't have comparison. Other school systems have been providing this data for more than 10 years. So we can look to other schools, other large school systems and see what they're providing now and how they do it. One important thing that's missing is, you know, Sunil, you were talking before about the ability to compare your school to another school. I actually don't even, I don't think that that's actually the ambitious ask, right? The ambitious ask is what is the vision for this school, right? The building leaders um, and our MCPS leadership, they should be communicating and sharing what is the audacious goal? What is our ambitious goal for the data we want to see on this website at this school this year, next year, the near, year after? I think that is what we as communities should be comparing our data to. I don't, I, it feels fractious and frankly, not and almost a little lazy to be saying like, well, that school is doing this, so our school should be doing this. Let's be talking about what we need to do to unlock the potential at, in this community. Where does this community want to go? What should the numbers at this school look like? So my so my ask would be, what do we want the numbers to look like at this school on this dashboard as we as parents, caregivers, students, faculty members are looking at this? I think that is more ambitious. It's more inspiring. I think it creates better community. But you also have to see what's possible to know, to be able to set those goals. You do. Goals. And you have to understand that we've got Blueprint for Maryland, right? So there are, it's not just what is our school want. It's what is expected from this law that right. schools must achieve. In fact, and Laura, there's another school system that's putting out blue, that they're posting their blueprint reports like three times a year on their site. 
Yes. And so, yeah, we, we do need some work in um, um, communicating what the blueprint is doing and, and how are our meeting goals. Because I don't think we talked about how the rest of Montgomery County is on an open data platform way back. Uh, and I think 2015, uh, MCPS dipped their toe in there. And there were a few reports on that platform. And it looked like they all stopped in 2016. Other school systems sometimes just do the spreadsheets and they don't do that system. Um, so there's different models. And it looked like MCPS picked the spreadsheet way, which um, as advocates, we did say, hey, that's an option. You know, <laughs> if you just want to put out spreadsheets, uh, we could deal with that. But it is interesting to me that they still are not um, participating in the open data portal. But I just went on there and I did see that Montgomery College is. Um, put some data on the open data portal. So I was on the board when the open data platform for Montgomery County went live and it was wonderful is what we were asking for. So again, that was what, 2016? Um, and they wanted to partner with us. They wanted to have not just Montgomery College data, but they also wanted to have MCPS data there as well. Mm -hmm. um, and that's when MCPS dipped their tiny toe <laughs> into that platform and then I guess backed away the next year. Um, so do you know what happened with the uh, open data platforms and why um, MCPS doesn't participate? I I don't know. I, I just know when I had at, when I asked to put these uh, this data in a sortable format, uh, the way other school systems had done when I would make those requests when I was on the board, um, one staffer told me that if we did that, then it would be manipulated, manip manipulatable by the public and people would get the wrong ideas. And um, I don't know if that person spoke, who that person spoke for, but the resistance was great enough that I was told by the president of the board to stop making these requests for sortable data. So just to clarify, the school's pro school profiles database currently does not allow you to build and pull reports. No, it looks like that there are four Excel spreadsheets that you can um, download. Um, one at elementary, one at middle school, one at high school and one for special school. And it had the limited data that we talked about earlier, which was the demographics and class size. Okay. So demographics and class size downloadable in a spreadsheet, but everything else still fundamentally a separate web page for every school rather than an ability to pull composite reports, correct? Then that's sort of where you right. want to go. And, and, and attendance rate, that's the other. Okay. Column so nothing on the learning side, which is, I think, the concern of most parents, right? In terms of, um, uh, right. uh, you know, spreadsheets. Well, for the parent, for the right, for the parent who's going <laughs> to download the data and create a report, which I again, like, right? Policymakers should be doing that, right? The data should be like we should be able to to compare this data. Right, because we're trying to, right, we're problem solvers, we're trying to work in collaboration with the system and our partner organizations um, to improve things, right? So the ability to sort and analyze the data is really important so that we can have cogent conversations, right, with our partners, the school system. Um, I do think that, um, but I do think to the extent that the data can be downloaded, you know, for the parent or caregiver or student who wants to look at it, right? That's great. It should be. I mean, I get, I get it, right? This is this is talk about vulnerability, right? It's if, I imagine it feels very exposing, right, and vulnerable for any system, right? Whether it's a hospital system or a county system or a school system to release all the data, warts and all. I totally get it, right? And I worry about the teachers and the buildings where the performance scores don't look great, right? Like I, you know, we don't want this to be, we don't want, we don't want them to feel like 
we're using this data as a gotcha or, you know, to beat up on them. I think we really have to stress that the more information we all have, the better we can work together to solve problems and to improve things for all students. Um, and that this isn't, that we're not trying to use this data as a cudgel. We're trying to use this data to elevate the conversation. Like Kathy, I want to make sure that our teachers and our families feel supported. And part of that has to be empowerment. They have to feel empowered that they can speak up. They have to feel empowered with the information that they have access to, and they have to know what they can do with that information. And so if um, you know, you're looking at this information and uh, the public is able to compare one school to another, not for the purpose of you know, it doesn't get us anywhere for, for just looking at it and saying, oh, you're you're not performing, you're terrible. It's what do we need to do? How do we read, how do we redistribute resources to make sure that the students in this building are getting what they need to reach their potential? Okay. And and that's that's really what all of this is about. And and as far as open Montgomery goes, you know, the op really that is that helps board members, county council members. What was telling for me was that Montgomery planning needed to build the Excel sheets from the schools at a glance, you know, one by one, it's one true. cell at a time. Yes. I mean, you it's want, true. if anybody should have access to that data, it should be Montgomery planning. Yeah. Right. right. And I just want to stress, um, again, I think all of us are very happy that things are moving in the right direction. Um, I, I want to stress also that there is additional data so that these these the school profiles dashboard isn't linking to the other data that exists. I think it's really difficult, right? It's a huge lift to figure out how to present this much data. I mean, at a really granular level, right? There's some data here that's really granular. And you want this site to be, it's, a, it's really challenging, right? You want to present a lot of data. It needs to be clear. It needs to be visually appealing. And it needs to be, it needs to be, provide utility for just the average person who opens it up, right? Who's never looked at school data before. But I think in terms of usability, and I'm sure they have some kinks to work out, to be honest, with a rollout like this, I would expect a lot more kinks. But it's, you know, I... I think in terms of the usability of the site, the functionality and the the visual of it, again, the languages provided, I think definitely on the right path. So I see a great framework here where they can start plugging in some more data and add some more tabs. Of course, we don't want a million more tabs because then it becomes unwieldy and nobody's gonna use it, right? Like fundamentally, we want people to use this. We want them to bookmark it. We want them to use it. Um, and traffic through it. So I find it, you know, really visually appealing. Thank you all for taking the time to join the show. I hope uh, MCPS is going to listen to the show uh, and all your feedback, and you'll get a, a improved uh, schools profiles dashboard. Thank you, Sunil. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Sunil. Sunil. You're listening to I Hate Politics. I'm Sunil Dasgupta. I'll be back with a wrap up, including lessons from my conversation with local education activists, Kathy Stoker, Audra Dove, Laura Stewart, and Jill Ortman Faust. Santa Fe, never to return again Looking for a lover to make amends I don't know where I stand Losing my mind, my girl gone with it Bury my heart for just one more minute now You're listening to I Hate Politics. I am Sunil Dasgupta. What lessons can we draw from my conversation with education activists Jill ortman Faust, Laura Stewart, Kathy Stoker, and Audra Dove. First, it is clear that after 10 years of demanding sortable schools data, MCPS 
has made a definitive start. The task of figuring out what data to put out and how to put it out, what will be useful and what is necessary, who the target audience is for the data, is all challenging. But it is a start, a worthy one, upon which more has to be built. The user experience from the drop down menus and toggling frames are still clumsy. The website may not be fully optimized for viewing on mobile phones. MCPS has also decided to maintain its own databases rather than join the county's open data platform. But that means reinventing the wheel and a longer period of trial and error, which really is not necessary. Second, one of the most important questions MCPS has to answer is who the dashboard should serve. MCPS is a public agency, so clearly it has to be the public itself. But it turns out that Montgomery Planning, the public agency responsible for permitting real estate developments based on school capacity, did not, or at least in the past, did not have access to this data. A searchable, sortable, report-generating dashboard would also help the county council, where staffers have had to look at PDF profiles of schools to construct their own data sets. Kathy Stoker brought up an important point, that too much data may not be very useful. And a school community ought to focus on its own building without thinking too much about others. But keep in mind that if the question here is fairness, it is important to know what's happening in the school in the next neighborhood. The foundation of the scientific method is comparison. And comparative data empowers parents and teachers to ask the right questions and provide constructive suggestions. Lastly, the new dashboard still does not connect to other databases MCPS possesses and makes available publicly. The equity model from the Office of Shared Accountability and the coursework information that is available on the websites of individual schools have to be integrated. But tying together these different databases into a composite picture is going to take years. The link to the new MCPS dashboard and the feedback button are both in the show notes if you want to take a test drive. That's all for this episode of I Hate Politics, where we aim to stem the decline in local news by working with community voices. I Hate Politics is produced by me, Sunil Dasgupta, and assistant producer, Daniel Galeo with support from the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. I direct UMBC's political science program at the universities at Shady Grove in Montgomery County, where, among other things, we explore and learn about politics, government, and society close to home. Music for this episode comes from Rockville pop rock singer-songwriter Andrew Glore and his band Drew Pictures. You can find more of his music on Spotify and at drewpicturesmusic.com. If you want to share your music on the show or know someone else who might want to, please email us at producer at ihppod.org. I hope you will rate, subscribe, and share the podcast as we bring you stories about politics close to you and to your home. See you next time. I give a damn Hold my hand You understand me But do you love me? That was many years ago Before we lived and worked At home up county I had a loved and I lost count of all the lines we cross will you hold me oh you never never hold me i believe
Back when you loved me. <laughs> <laughs> 